All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from what they like to say here is across the pond in the UK, Paul Morton, who is in Hampshire uh, via Glasgow in Scotland. How are you doing, Paul? I'm doing crackingly well, thank you. You've got the sunshine over here. We've got well, we're actually we're not too bad towards the end of the day here. Yeah, I know my my you know back home in Ireland, you know they always love to say uh, you know I you say how's the weather, and they say oh it was fantastic the other day. <laughs> uh, you know we had a day of sunshine. <laughs> How was your summer? Both days were great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now they weren't consecutive days, but they were no, no, both no. great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the 18th uh, of May that was pleasant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the first half of the day. Paul Morton, and you are an accomplished leadership expert, author, and CEO of the Practical Leadership uh, Academy, rich background in building and leading global revenue teams, and you also are the host of the Practical Leadership Podcast, bring a wealth of knowledge to leadership management and personal development to sales leaders everywhere. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how do you, how do you support sales managers how do you unlock the potential for their growth how do you actually how do you go from accidental to intentional because if we were just talking before we came on air the and it's not just for sales it's not just for sales leaders but the typical promotion path because we seem to decide that the only acknowledgement of somebody or or progression or career path they have is Paul, you're a fantastic salesperson. You're the best salesperson we have. You get to be the sales manager. Best of luck. Just make sure everybody does what you do. And instead of just having one of you, we're going to have 20 of you now. Magnificent. Well, the traditional method is exactly like you said. And then what follows after that very moment where you realize that I'm the boss is crickets. Yeah. Nothing. And you're sitting there looking at your team who are looking at you expectantly as if you know what to do and waiting for you to tell them what to do. And when you don't, they go off and they do their own thing and they do it to the best of their ability. And that's when the problems start, regardless of what your department is. But the big challenge, because in revenue facing, revenue functions, we are the most tightly measured, tightly controlled most returnable on investment part of any business that you can possibly imagine because you've all got a number. Yeah. Did you hit it? No. Okay, let's try again, shall we? Yeah. So the challenge is how do you put people into a position where they're going to succeed? And it's not where are you good at your last job? Where are you good at your last job? Well, actually, I was working as a dishwasher down the pub. Well, that mm -hmm. means you're going to be great at a heart surgeon. That No, <laughs> no, that's, that's not what we talk about. Yeah. It's what do you need to be doing for the job that you're in just now? And yeah. quite frankly, for a salesman, you don't need to be the best seller. You don't need to be the best marketeer. You don't need to be the best CS person. Yeah. You need to earn for the success of other people. And that's and that's such a, a profoundly different uh, approach, uh, Paul. Because, like like we said, I mean, we just uh, you could be the best salesperson, but but you could actually not know what makes you the best salesperson. And plenty of people are are very very good at things. They're unconsciously very highly competent. But if you ask them to actually describe or codify what they do, they'd be like, mm, can't really do that. Uh, and that's why. Um, you know, often when they get into that uh, position, it's like kind of just kind of do what I used to do. And people were going, we don't really know what you used to do. And go, well, I don't really know what I used to do either. So uh, this is great. Just as you said, then just keep doing what you're doing and I'll just tinker. And I think that's what happens. A lot of sales, they come into the position and then they just tinker a little bit. Well, you've got really two sorts of salespeople, don't you? You've mm -hmm. got data-driven, methodical, process-orientated, and you've got super relationship ones, mm -hmm. right? They're both brilliant, both fabulous. And let's say you, you promote one of them and you say, right, off you pop. But half your team, let's imagine, is data driven. Half your team is super relationship type. And I'm the super relationship type. What do you think I think of the process guys? Or I'm the process guy. What do you think I think of the relationship guys? And mm -hmm. I try and get one to work like me, but not that. It's not hard. It, the, the, the understanding that you need as a revenue leader as an organizational leader when you're promoting managers is to promote people 
who burn for the success of other people, mm. who are good coaches, who can, they're the people around you who are the ones that, they're the go-to guys or girls. You know, people go to them because they can explain what they do, because they can help you at the moment of need or in the context that you have. And that's the one that you want to promote. Now, you might say, well, they're, they're not actually the best seller. Maybe I shouldn't be promoting them because they won't exemplify the success of. That's not their job. Their mm -hmm. job is a force multiplier. Right? Yep. You as the boss want to pull the lever of success and it is only tenuously attached to anything. And the one mm -hmm. thing it is attached to is your wee manager who's sitting there going, ah, either I don't know what to do or I can clearly articulate the vision you have, mm -hmm. organize these people and get them to do what they need to do, hold them accountable, keep them on track and you know, push their success forward. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, if you look at it in sports, I mean, look at it in um, in football, soccer, whatever. I mean, rarely do the best, you know, the best players make the best coaches or managers later. So I mean, a lot of the top ones, most successful ones, were very mediocre players, mm -hmm. but they focus then, you know, on the management side. But it, it, it's that point, though, isn't it, Paul? Is that uh, we don't train the management principles, right? We don't we don't really go into the fundamentals of management. And I think less so even in sales, because you think, oh, sales management is this distinct from management management, right? Whereas oh. no, you need still need to know how to manage the fundamentals of management or the fundamentals of management. Aye. I mean, there are what two or three meetings specific types of meetings you need to know how to hold for a for as a sales manager a forecast meeting right what's mm -hmm. happening now what's closing now what can i believe and what can't i a pipeline meeting what do i need to develop to pull these things in and then your all hands type thing vision transfer but that's kind of universal beyond that it's how do you hire the right people how do you fire them when they don't go bad? How do you hold them accountable? How do you set up uh, expectations? How do you give difficult feedback? By the way, that's just the skill set that you need. Yep. And you need to layer that upon, do you know who you are? Are you able to listen? Now, good sellers should be good listeners. Mm -hmm. Good sellers should know thyself. You want to know, your, you want to know other people, look in the mirror. Right? Yep. Learn to know yourself. Are you a stress bunny? Do you can you handle stress? Again, good sellers can typically handle this. So we get through the sort of knowing yourself bit quite quickly, and you get into the meat of the mechanisms of leadership, which is management. I mean, mm -hmm. leadership, a definition, is magnanimity. It is seeing and driving for the success in other people. It's love. It really is. It, it comes down to that is. I used to say that you didn't have to like the people you worked with, but you did have to love them. Now, mm -hmm. in a good way, because you don't want a call from HR, and there mm -hmm. are different sorts of love. You have yep. eros, which is a romantic love. You have <laughs> storge, you have um, philia, which is the friendship one. But the one you're looking for is agape, which is this divine willing of good in the other person. I burn for your success. And it's a mechanism of getting people there. I'm going to take you somewhere that you would not get in your own. And I'm going to do it using the fairly straightforward tools of management. Mm -hmm. Objectives, hold you accountable, have difficult. And it's just stuff you need to know, but nobody ever gets taught it. No, and, and to your point, though, uh, you know, working or burning for the success of other people. Uh, I mean, what, oftentimes when you have, and what you want in, in your top salespeople is pe people are pretty self-centered, right? You know, they're like, you know, I mean, they're, and and they're used also to being the hero right you know they're used to like when they bring it home being the being center of attention being hero now we're asking somebody to step back and uh put aside your put aside your ego the thing that's got you to where you are if you like uh and you're no longer the center of attention your job is to is to push other people forward that's why that's why uh, oftentimes you don't have the right skill set that somebody else, as you said, somebody who's more into you know the success of other people who can learn the management principles, et cetera, is going to be far more effective. Well, thinking about the background of uh, Pipeliner, which is mm -hmm. the Austrian School of Economics, it's yep. Mises and Hayek, those guys. If you think about 
what success means for the sales. I love sales. Sales is fabulous mm -hmm. because it's a microcosm of existence and humanity. Sure. But a good egotistical, self-centered salesperson will rapidly reach a peak and not be able to pass it because they listen only for the buying signal. Mm -hmm. They don't listen to the human. They don't put themselves in the buyer's position. They don't think of the other as an equal, far less anything else. And in reality, you're looking to be of service. The great salespeople, the ones who don't even sell, they are, this is, this is the Mises approach is, it's not selfish, it's selfless, mm -hmm. but for the common good. And I'm not talking socialism, I'm talking mm -hmm. for the common good of the organization, the company yeah. that you're within. And that is the type you're looking for. So if you've got somebody who's phenomenal in those terms, get them as your manager. <laughs> if you can, you probably won't make as much money. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, I guess that's the other part too. But, uh, and then comes the coaching element, right, Paul? Because here's something that's so lacking. I mean, here in the States, I'm often saying, like, you know, most people's last experience of coaching was their high school football coach here, you know, yeah. shouting at them from the sideline, you know, same in the UK or Ireland, you know, our, 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 our sports coaches, you know, shouting at us. Um, therefore, we grew up with this idea that coaching is telling. It's like, listen, do this, do this, do this. And if you do this, everything will be fine. And that's not coaching. Uh, and, and coaching is so core to successful sales management. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the combination that I found works best is if you think about the best teams of anything, mm -hmm. team sports team, whatever it was. And I do have the voice of my coach resonating in my ears, mm -hmm. which he basically goes, Martin, you're a balloon. You're waddling like a penguin, son. Pick <laughs> up your feet. You know, I can hear that. Um, <laughs> thank you. And uh, what you, the, 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 the good coaches, they train you on what you need to do and they coach out the rest. Mm -hmm. Or other way around, they coach out what's in there and they fill in the gaps. So you're, I mean, the best thing you can do, you can't turn your you can't turn your people into a coach overnight. Mm -hmm. It's an easy thing for anybody to do. The next time somebody comes to you with a question, ask them one back. Boss, how do I do this? What are our options? That's mm -hmm. it. Ask them that. What are our options? Off they pop, and they then have to come up with a solution. You don't have to know the answer, but they have to come back with a solution. What yeah. are our options? All of a sudden, your managers, if they start asking that, become coaches. No, mm -hmm. I'm not taking a qualification or something like that, but it's a dark, simple way of getting people to say, oh, you come up with the best answer because you're closest to the problem and therefore closest to the solution and are the one who's going to have to do it. And if you come up with it, you own it. If I tell you what to do, you'll do exactly as I've told you and not a letter <laughs> more or less. <laughs> but if I make you come up with the answer, you've owned it. And it's probably more accurate than anything I could come up with. <laughs> yeah. What other no, option? Yeah, no, I, I love that. No, I, I'm my old coach in school echoes in my ears. Like, you listen, it's only five minutes into the game. You've a yellow card. Don't get yourself sent off again. <laughs> <laughs> was that you? Oh, uh, yeah, no, that me. And that was back in the day when getting sent off was a lot harder than it is today. <laughs> but, but coming back to what you were saying, one of the things... Um, one of the things that we make a big mistake on often is this idea of of always you know when somebody goes into a management position or coaching position they immediately because we're we're hardwired like this as humans immediately go oh here's a bunch of things i paul needs to fix right these are things that paul doesn't do well i, I need to focus 100 percent on this instead of me going hang on a second let me look at the things that paul does really really well and now can i can, and look, and because you mentioned in the best coaches with teams, <clears throat> can I reorganize my team so that everybody is accentuating their strengths rather than me focusing on on Paul's so-called weaknesses, which may be things that Paul's not good at, it's never going to be good at. And I'm mm. going to waste a heck of a lot of time trying to make you good at something that you don't want to do, you're no good at, and you're never going to be any good at, as opposed to figuring out how can I make use of your strengths so that we all benefit. Well, as it happens, don't you know, <laughs> session two in the course, uh, the, the <laughs> course soon to be book, is managing from your strengths. And the whole thing is, um, I base it on a lot of research that was done by the Gallup group. Mm -hmm. And 
the idea is that you can get somebody from a scale of one to ten. Okay, so you got a skill and you're sitting there. Uh, you're a prospector, and mm -hmm. you're you're about a seven out of ten. And in terms of closing, you're about a two. Now, mm -hmm. what should I focus on? Well, you're closing, of course, because you're yeah. rubbish at it. Well, if it's a toxic behavior or a toxic skill or an essential skill you have to have, yes, you need to do something about it. But I'm never going to get you to be the world's best closer. Mm -hmm. I am, however, going to be able to get you from a seven to a nine or maybe even a 10. Now, that is valuable to my team. Having people who are nine or 10 out of 10 at a particular skill, wow, that's where you really move the needle. That's mm -hmm. the effort. And you know what? See if you try and get me to do something exactly as you said, John, that I don't like and I'm not good at. How much effort am I going to put into it? None. Next to nothing. But if you say, Paul, you're really rather good at this whole uh, negotiation stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's send you on a wee course. We'll go off and we'll do some stuff together and we'll get you the experiences and the opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to be 10 out of 10 in a gold star. I am going to fall over myself yep. to work for you. Not only am I going to get better at this, I'm going to approach my manager. I'm going to say, John, thank you so much for that. How long will you let me work for you wherever you go because you recognize my strengths? Yeah. Yeah. And it's that whole thing of just being being more being more creative and being more maybe creative in how you organize your team and how you leverage because I think that's a perfect that's a perfect example there of somebody, you know, great uh, you know, you've got great door openers, but they're not great at the process afterwards, right? You know, so hey, why don't you just have your great door openers opening more doors and have other people who are who are better at the pro taking them through the sales process take over. Totally. And it's this, I mean, that also feeds to the idea that we've got all these grads on the phone trying to get meeting you know, enterprise mm -hmm. sales. And yeah, 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 yeah. We've yes. got some 25 year old grad trying to get some grunt like me on the other end of the phone. <laughs> I said, like, sweetheart, pal, I'm not talking to you because you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. However, if a peer of relative experience, a senior person is doing the door opening, I will happily be handed off to terminate the process. Mm -hmm. Right, but I want to know that there's somebody there with the chops, with the meat, with the you know the ability. So it's a perfect example. Put people into the position where they can excel. Don't put them in a position where they're going to fail. Set yeah. people up for success because that way you're setting your organization up for success. Yeah, and and it's just funny, isn't it, Paul? It's just funny how 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 simple a concept that is, but how, I guess I said, we're, we're just hardwired. We get distracted into the opposite approach. And the other thing that I, I, I have often come across with, with um, some sales managers is that uh, is the idea where they, instead of focusing maybe on the early stages and helping, you know, qualify, helping make sure the process has been followed is that they decide to go become a super closer instead and just parachute in at the end of deals. Oh, yeah. me, hero. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And obviously that that in itself has has it may be it may be a short term success. You may help get something over the line he or she, but he's destroy um set back the salesperson, focus mm -hmm. in the wrong place. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, there's a lot of negative outcomes of that. If you think about it, I mean, I don't I don't know if you've got kids, but a lot of leadership mm -hmm. comes from you know, how you rear children yeah. is how you develop and see them develop. You wouldn't go to your kid when you talk about them to somebody else where you give them a new bike and you say, oh, he's a bit of a faller. You know, he's, <laughs> he's learning to ride or he's learning to walk. He's a bit of a faller, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. You go in and you say, well, I expect you to fall over three or four yeah. times before you grasp this and then you will be on your way. I will demonstrate to you how you do this, but then you need to be on your own. I'm setting mm -hmm. you up for success for yourself. Yeah. You, you, you need to teach people to be self-reliant. If you're always there, you'll always need to be there. Mm -hmm. Right Now, that might feed your ego, but it won't feed your pocketbook. Yeah, no, it won't. And then, and then as you said, your salesperson is not developing because now they're just deferring to you. Exactly. And you're a bottleneck. And that's the yeah. last thing you should be. Yeah. So how come um, that 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 part I always seen that it seems to be the hardest part is when people get into sales management is that idea of really 
focusing on you know moving their attention and focusing more on the early stages of making sure the right things are in the pipeline making sure things are being qualified the process is being you know that's where coaching can come in you know that's where you can make an impact because you can't really make an impact at the end of a sales cycle you can discount for sure but you can't there's no value you add there no i mean whenever i get called in to look at processes as well and i do that sort of stuff too mm -hmm is there's the top, middle, and bottom, right? So invariably, somebody comes in and says, oh, my sales team's rubbish. And you're thinking, mm, no, they're not. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I, I've never met them. I don't know you, but I doubt it very much indeed. I would imagine you have either lost or never had product market fit. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that your uh, ideal customer profile is, oh, anybody with a pulse <laughs> is a little bit wide, yeah. okay? which means that your deals aren't converting. So where do you focus? Yeah. I would say that the earlier stages right now and then the stuff that you've got in your pipe closing right now, make sure you're pulling things to a decent conclusion, helping people to negotiate, helping people to avoid discounting, okay? And then the earlier stages, being brutally honest with yourself that this has been in the pipe for 10 days longer than it should have been. It isn't ever going to close. Or this uh, character over here is so far removed from our ideal customer. If we get it, it's going to cause us a world of pain in six months' time. Let's, yeah. let's get rid of it now. That sort of um, that, uh, pragmatism. That, yeah, that, that's one of the hardest parts. I mean, I was running an organization once in the parent, from, in the parent company and uh, for a parent company, and uh, – and we went through this process of like cleaning pipeline. Like I said, you know, forget this. I used to call it like the feel good funnel. I said, forget this, this mm -hmm. idea of having five X or 10 X or whatever the heck it is you want is all we're doing is loading the early stages of the pipeline full of garbage. Like you were just saying, yep. right. Cause it makes us feel good. Oh, look how big our pipeline is. Now the fact that 90% of the stuff is never going to close is, yeah. you know, we, we tend to push, push that aside. But when I did an exercise of cleaning the pipeline, I, you know, the parent company suddenly, what's happened to your pipeline? Last, this time last year, it was like, you know, this much higher. And I said, yeah, because it was garbage in it. I'm not putting garbage in anymore. And that takes a little bit of uh, fortitude. Hmm. And I think it takes a lot of trust. You mm -hmm. have to have the trust from yeah. your leadership as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot about the, the having the trust comes down to your leaders being able to see what you're doing and have faith that you actually know what you're doing yeah you know? so you've got to be successful in order to let them give you to give to have them give you enough rope yeah 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 and yeah and like i said you have to have the you have to have the guts to do it too to say like yeah. i'm going to go through this process because you know nobody like as you noticed what one of the things people hate the most is cleaning out pipelines because it's it's a psychological thing it's like as you said it's like that person that icp is so totally removed from our ideal customer but we still kept it in there and now you're still arguing to keep it in there why as <laughs> mm -hmm. a world of pain waiting to happen totally. exactly Exactly. Well, listen, this has been great, Paul. All of Paul's information will be below this video. But before we go, Paul, do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I have the Practical Leadership Academy, and it is designed to fix exactly this problem. It is the sort of folk who have great intent, good hearts, but just need the help to work out how to actually manage their teams better. And one of the great ways of doing that, one of the key things we talk about in the, the, the programs, nine, little nine-week programs, two times 30 minutes every week for nine weeks with some coaching in there as well. And one of the things is a how to fix your one-to-ones. And one of the giveaways in the link below will be a five-step process on how you fix your one-to-ones to check in with people, to give them feedback, to get the updates you need, plan for the future, and to coach them when you need. And it's a nice little guide. And it's part of the course, and it's a free gift. Happy to Excellent. do that. Excellent. Well, I would encourage you that you go uh, check that out. Uh, it, as as uh, Paul said at the outset, sales management, sales leadership, it's a force multiplier. It's the, it's, the, it's the fastest and most effective way to increase your revenue is you get good leadership in place that's, that's helping salespeople be better at what they do. So thank you again, Paul. Thank you for watching, listening. I'll see you all again very soon.